or a poor ape. A fast day. I want to focus in on the uh, Haftorah, the Haftorah of, um, of Tisha B'Av in the morning. It comes from Sefer Yirmiyahu. Now the fact is, just to learn the Haftorah itself is going to take a, a bit of time. So I'm going to try and focus on only one section of that Haftorah, but I'm not going to do that until we start reaching the end of the Shir. There's going to be one sentence in the Haftorah where the question will be asked, Alma of the Haaretz. Why was the land lost? Why did it all happen? Why did it all happen? The Churban. You'll ask anybody and they will tell you the Churban came, the destruction came because of Sin Ad Chinam. Everybody knows because there was hatred, there were divisions in Klag Yisrael, they were a people that were split. Uh, and that's it. Now, Sin Ad Chinam what I want to point out is that Sinat Chinam is only one aspect of the whole story of the Churban. There's a great deal more to it. And when we get a picture, or the larger picture, of why, why we lost our independence, why we were conquered, why all of that happened, it may give us, in certain respects, a an even more pessimistic view, if we were pessimistic <laughs> before, you'll, you'll, you'll need uppers after this year is, big, uh, is over. But then there's another possibility. The other possibility may be that when we take a look at the totality of the picture of what brought about the destruction of Bet Hamikdash, Second Temple, First Temple, when we finally see the whole picture, there may be points of real brightness. There may be points of light where we will be able to assess how far we've gone, that we have made steps forward. It's not all that black. It's pretty black, but not all that black. I'll tell you when this study began. The study began precisely 10 years ago in the month of Tammuz or of in 1994. Nice to show you the story was such. There was a gathering of the, uh, of the Jewish agency every summer, June, July, there's a, a gathering of the Jewish agency. Uh, people came from all over the world to be present. And uh, one of the speakers was going to be Shimon Peres. And I had an activist group in Harnof we infiltrated. I got 25 people uninvited into the hall. Now, if I ever tell them this, you understand, this will be the greatest security failure in the uh, history of the State of Israel. I got 25 dissidents into the hall. It was amazing. Everybody had a story, and we all got in. We all got in. Anyway, uh, I, I have to say that I, yes, uh, and I'm not ashamed of it all, I heckled uh, Shimon Peres and we got into a, quite a uh, back and forth. I accused him of being ready to divide Jerusalem. And he swore on a stack of, I don't know, Jewish agency brochures <laughs> that Jerusalem will forever remain ever remain united under the sovereignty of the state of Israel. All right, he now lied through his teeth. After the event was over, I'm, I'm walking in the hall, it took place, uh, this took place in the, in the Hilton. Now, I don't want to go through all of this. The Hilton is now the Crown Plaza. By taxi drivers in this city, the Hilton will remain Hilton until Mashiach and beyond. Just like they never heard of the Renaissance, it's the Ramada. And across the street, it'll be the Moriah forever and ever after. In Baal, Mishamal, In Baal, who knows In Baal? We old timers here know what the In Baal really was. Okay. 
Anyway, here it is. I'm walking through the hall in the Hilton, and somebody comes over to me and says to me, Rabbi, you're a zealot, and the zealots destroyed the temple. No more than a minute passes, and somebody else walks by me and says, You? You're a zealot. You destroyed the temple. In all good Hasidic stories, you don't really become curious until it happens for the third time. I walk into the hall and I, I walk over to ask somebody something says, I don't want to talk to you. You're a zealot. You destroyed the temple. <laughs> I said, no, I, I told him, really, I, I didn't, trust me, I didn't destroy the temple, believe me. Anyway, so I found out, I found out, I asked somebody and I found out. The night before, Yitzchak Rabin Hamanoach had ended his speech by saying, the zealots destroyed the temple. It was the, the attempt to uh, delegitimize anybody who disagreed. If you disagreed, then you're a right-wing extremist and you're a destructive force. Anybody who's a positive force goes along with everything, everything the government wants to do. All right. Uh, we still, we Americans, still have to teach them what democracy is here. Anyway, I went home thinking to myself, I'm a zealot. I destroyed the temple. I destroyed the temple. So therefore I set out to find out what indeed happened. What indeed happened. So I'm going to take you for a journey through a number of Gemaras, and then we're going to go through a, a Rambam and a Ramban, and then we'll finally get back to the Haftorah for, for Tish above in the morning. And, and, and then we're going to be left with a major question that we will, in Mirza Hashem, answer, that will give us, I believe, a total picture of what happened then and what our situation is like now. I'm not going to start with Haftari yet. Let's go over to the next sheet. A Gemara in Masech the Shabbos. First line begins, Omar Abaye, and you're going to have to follow along with me because I'm going to be skipping at certain places, but the fact is that even if you don't read it with me, you'll still understand what I'm talking about. Omar Abaye. Abaye said, Lo chorvor Yerushalayim, Ela b'shvil, Shechil lubat ha-shabbat. Abaye makes a clear and definite statement. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because there was desecration of Shabbat that took place in this city. Shenema, and he brings a Pasek, Pasek in Yechezkel, Umi Shabto Taihe Elimu Einechem, they turned their eyes away from my Shabbos. Vo'achel betocham, and Shabbos was desecrated in their midst. Quite a def definite statement. Lo Chorva Ela, it was destroyed only because of this there are going to be another seven definite statements like this. An unbelievable Gemara. Amr Rabbi Avu, Rabbi Avu said, Lo chorva Yerushalayim, elo b'shvil shebitlu kriyat shema shacharit va'arvit. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because people didn't read kriyat shema in the morning, the reading of the shema in the morning and in the evening as the halacha says that they're supposed to do. Men anyway. Shinema, as it says. Yeshayahu talks about, Hoi mashkime baboke, woe. Those who get up in the morning, Sheikhor yiridoku, they pursue, they pursue drink, they pursue liquor. Uksivin, it says, Vahoyo kinor vanevel tov v'cholil v'yayin m'shtev. He describes the parties that they were throwing in the city of Yerushalayim, with all sorts of bands playing, the kinor, the navel, the tov, with wine, that poal Hashem lo yabitu, but they did not look at what God did. They didn't see the hand of God. Uktiv, and another passage there says in Yeshayahu, lochein golo ami mi that's why my people went into exile, 
because they did not know me. They didn't truly know the meaning of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Third, Amar Rav Anunah, Rav Anunah said, Lo chove Yerushalayim ele v'shebitlu potinoko shel beit chaban. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because of the fact that they interrupted the Torah study of children. Children always have to study Torah. The Gemara later is going to say that even for the construction of the Bet HaMikdash, children will not be, in, this Torah study will not be interrupted. That's Rav HaMnun, Lo Chor Yerushalayim, El Bishil Shebit Lubati No Got Shel Beit Rabban Shenema, Shvoch Al Olol Pachutz, Cast out or pour out or destroy, Matam Shvoch, why should everything be poured out? Mishum to Olol, because the child is outside, he's not inside studying Torah. It could of course mean that maybe they, they didn't pay as much attention as they should to the education of their children. I mean, you can read it in, in many ways. It doesn't mean simply that they stop children from studying Torah. It, it may encompass all of the, uh, all that is involved in, in properly teaching Torah to young people. There are a lot of, a lot of things that are unnecessary in order to make it successful. And they didn't do that. By the way, so far, have you heard a word about zealots? Not one. No mention of zealots whatsoever. Okay? Omar Ula. Ula said, Lo chorbi rushlayim le mpnei shalom hoyo lehem boshet ponim ze mizeh. Says, Ula says, Yerushalayim was destroyed only because there was no shame. And of course, when it means no shame, it means there was a, a loss of, a loss of shame. Shame is an extremely positive force in every society. There may be a lot of things that we might want to do at one point or another, and what stops us, what holds us back, is shame. It's a positive force, as good a positive force as guilt, if not better. And there was no shame. There was no shame. A person wasn't ashamed to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. It doesn't mean that everybody was like that. Never get the picture as though this was an absolutely shameless city. I don't know. I, I imagine, I imagine Ula would have said, if we, he would have seen uh, the gay parade, he would have said, Lo chorva Yerushalayim, Ela b'shil, because there was no busha. There was no shame. There was no shame. Gemara goes on to say, uh, because, uh, because it says, Hovishu kito evo osu, they did abominations, gambosh lo yevoshu, and they were not ashamed of the abominations that they did. Omar Abi Yitzchak. Abi Yitzchak said, Lo chav Yerushalayim, ele b'shvil shehushvu katan v'gadol. Small, Small and big were all alike. In other words, there was not, they lacked a sense of, of proportion. There was a sense of proportion. Uh, in other words, the, uh, huh? Respect. They were talking about respect. In other words, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. There are those who are opposed, and every so often, there's a cry against it. Rabbis have no right to offer opinions in matters of politics. Rabbis should stay in the base medrash. That's where they belong. Which means, of course, the following. Any corrupt politician can express his uh, view. Any corrupt politician. A anybody in the street has a right to... Uh, to express his view. An Arab member of Knesset has a right to express his view. On the contrary, if you don't listen to his view, that's racism. Any hilaria and any schlock has the right to express an opinion. 
but not a Rav. And certainly not if he's a God will be a soil. He doesn't have the right to express his opinion. I'm reacting to an editorial in the Haaretz two weeks ago about the grave danger of, of Rabbi Avram Shapiro, you understand? He is a great source of danger to this country because, because he's expressing opinions of halacha about politics. Halacha is not rational, and therefore you can't take the irrational and impose that upon the rational. So I, I sent off a letter that they didn't publish, that if, when a rabbi paskins like you, that psak halach is the most rational of all. All of a sudden, halach is rational. If the halach is just not like you, then of course it's irrational. Hushu cotton for God. Over here it's worse. It's not hushu cotton for God. The cotton can express his opinion. The cotton can express his opinion. But the rabbi cannot express his opinion. Oh, you know, I do like rabbis. I do like rabbis. It's one of my faults. I admit it. All right? Tomorrow goes on to say, as as it says, the people were just like the Kohen. And it says afterwards, that's the land will be emptied. Hurban is going to come. By the way, when I read that Pasuk now, the Pasuk is saying that the people and the Kohen, who's the great spiritual leader, are equal. I have, it's a theme of mine that I've said over the years. Klal Yisrael is healthy. The Am is healthy. I'm not so sure about our leadership. We're healthy. Our hearts are in the right place. I'm not so sure about our leadership. And I'm just, you know, what do you mean I'm not so sure? I'm pretty sure, but all right. But I try to be nice. You have to be nice before Tisha B'Av. Amma, Mara goes further. Amma, Rav Amram, Rav Rav Shime Bar Abba, Rav Shime Bar Abba, Rav Hanin, Lo Chorva Yerushalayim, El Bishvil Shalo Hochichu Zeh Zeh. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because they did not admonish one another. There are times you have to speak out. There are times you have to tell somebody what's right and what's wrong. You can't simply sit back and say, listen, it's not my business. By the way, by the way, I mean this seriously. Being part of the Shar Sheret today is a form of tochacha. It's a form of admonishing. It's expressing an opinion. It's telling others how we feel and what we believe is right. That's tochacha. Tochacha doesn't have to mean that I walk over to somebody and tell them, listen, you're a machal shambas. You're an Eiffel Trekkis. You're going to fry in Gehenna. That's not what tochacha is. Tochacha, on the contrary, has to be uh, an, expre an opinion that's expressed strongly in a positive manner. In a positive manner. It's tochacha. And by the way, somebody said, if you don't know where to stand, just get on to Rechov Yafo. You'll find somebody who's going to let you in. Somebody will let you in. Any place. Rechov Yafo. Come join me. Come join me. Harnof, Harnof is going to be standing between Mach, Shuk Machna Yehuda and the Davidka on Rechov Yafo. If everybody else is going to throw you out on Rehov Yafo, we'll take you in. <laughs> All right. The Gemara goes on to say, I'm going to start skipping already. Uh, two lines further. Amar Rabbi Yehuda lo chorva Yerushalayim el b'shvil shabizu ba talmidei chachamen. Yerushalayim was destroyed only because they shamed talmidei chachamen publicly in Yerushalayim. Serious. I don't want to go into this. If I go into this, we'll never get out of it. We'll never get out of it. But remember, each one is saying that this is the reason. Each one sees this is the reason. Further, we have, uh, uh, we, we can go all the way down to the bottom, four lines from the bottom. Omar Rava, Lo Chorva, I believe Rava is the eighth Rava says Yerushalayim was destroyed only because 
people of Amana, trustworthy, people you can trust, you can bet on them, you can count on them, people who are honest, there was a lack of honesty. That's the reason why the Rishon was destroyed, okay? We have eight opinions here, eight opinions. By the way, not one of them is Sinas Chinam, even though, of course, you could say that a number of them are included under the rubric of Sinat Chinam. The Lo Hochichu Zedzeh, O Shabizu Po Tamide Chachamim. That may be considered Sinat Chinam, but it Gemara here doesn't say Sinat Chinam. I'm taking you now to the next one, the famous Gemara in Gitan, the famous Gemara in Gitan, the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, Yerushalayim was destroyed. And the Gemara, the Gemara tells us the story of a man who had a, he had a friend whose name was Kamsa. He had an enemy who was Bar Kamsa. And he was making a face, he was making a chas, and he was making a simcha. He sent his servant to invite Kamsa, who's his friend. Servant made a mistake, invited Bar Kamsa. Bar Kamsa comes to the party. The fellow sees his arch foe, Bar Kamsa, then he gets very upset and he tells him to get out. Bar Kamsa says, listen, I'll pay for whatever I eat. No, get out. I'll pay for half of the, uh, of the whole suda here. No. Anyway, he threw him out. And Bar Kamsa decided, and here's something that sometimes is overlooked. The Gemara says, what really angered Bar Kamsa is not simply the fact that he was thrown out, that he was embarrassed, but Talmidei Chachamim was sitting there and nobody objected. Lo michuba. There wasn't anybody who stood up on his behalf. So he decided that he's going to go to Rome and he's going to tell uh, Caesar the Jews have rebelled against you. Who comes there? Uh, Caesar says, how do I know that the Jews have rebelled? So he says, give me a sacrifice. I'll bring it to Jerusalem and you'll see whether they sacrifice it or not. And, and he made a blemish in the eyelid that according to halacha, you can't bring that as a sacrifice. But as far as Goyim are concerned, they could bring that as a sacrifice for their idols. He comes to Yerushalayim, so now Yerushalayim is thrown into an absolute dilemma. And, and there was, so there were those who said that, listen, we're talking about Pikuach Nefesh. Let's sacrifice the, uh, let's bring the animals as a sacrifice. Otherwise, Rome is going to think that we have rebelled and, and the consequences will be terrible. So there was a gentleman there by the name of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilos. And Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilos said, no, you can't sacrifice that because then people are going to say that we sacrifice on the altar even that which is blemished. So there was a second plan. The second plan was let's kill Bar Kamsar so that he doesn't go back to Rome and report. So Zechariah ben Avkilos said again, no, because if we do that, then people are going to say that one who makes a blemish and a sacrifice is put to death. Terrible mistake. Then comes, I have underlined, Rabbi Yochanan's great statement, Omar Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says, An v'tanutosha Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilos. The humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilus hecherivo et beitenu v'sorfo et hecholenu v'higlitonu b'artzenu. Rashi explains his patience. The patience of Rabbi Zechariah is that which caused our house to be destroyed, the temple to be burned, and we to be sent into exile. Number of things over here. Number one, here we, we have a, something we would never have thought of. We never thought of one man, Zechariah ben Avkilos. Zechariah ben Avkilos. Now, I, I'm caught in a real dilemma right now. There's a, a, a five-word Rashi. There's a five-word Rashi that I would want to learn with you, but I, I may not be permitted. Now, if, if, if it's said outside this room that I learned the Rashi with you, I, I may be in... A, a, I, I may be under investigation or I will end up at the uh, Migrash Harusim uh, sometime today. Rashi says the following. One, two, three, four, five, six words. An v'tanuto, 
The last line of the Rashi. Savlanuto. The patience of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilus. Shesoval, it says that he was able to suffer the presence of this Bar Kamsa, the low Harogo, and didn't kill him, or didn't permit him to be killed. Why does Rashi say, because they didn't kill him? Weren't there two options? What was the other option? Bring the sacrifice. Rashi doesn't say that. You know what Rashi is really saying? that of the two options, the only real option is to kill Bar Kamsa. Here is where I'm at a dilemma. Why does Rashi come out on the side of killing him? Because Bar Kamsa has Din Rodev. I said the two words that the President of the State said that you should stop learning in the yeshivas about Din Rodev. I just said it. I'm in serious trouble. Bar Kamsa has a Din Rodef. He wants to bring Rome against the Jewish state. He has a Din Rodef. So it's amazing that Rashi has taken a position. And I'll tell you why. Why didn't Rashi write? Why didn't Rashi write that? Uh, how, how did he tolerate this? Why didn't he have them bring the sacrifice? There are two reasons. Number one, because the fact is that Bar Kamsa was a Rodef. He, Lahalacha, Lahalacha is one who should be put to death. He is endangering all of Israel. All of Israel is endangered because of him. And second, I want to tell you something else. Why does Rabbi Yochanan throw the weight of the destruction and the dispersion of the Jewish people upon the shoulders of Rabbi Zechariah bin Avkilus, that aside from here and one other place, we never hear of him. The Gemara is making an extremely important statement. Rabbi Yochanan is making an important statement. Leadership has to be able to make a decision. If you can't make a decision, you can't be a leader by Claudius. To tell me that you can't do this and you can't do that, and you leave us no option, this is an abdication of leadership. You can't abstain. You can't abstain from life. When there's a crucial vote up, you can't abstain from a vote. You can't abstain from taking a position. We don't have that luxury. There may be people who want to walk around and say, listen, now you know, I'm it's too much for me. I can't handle all of this that's going on. There's no such thing. Life calls for the ability to be able to make a decision. And when leadership is caught in the position of not being able to stand up and do what should be done, this is an abdication of leadership. And therefore, Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilis, he places the whole blame for Khur ben Abayat on Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilis. We're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. I don't have to ask the question again. We have not yet heard about whom? The Zilots. We haven't heard about the Zilots. We're looking for the Zilots. We're looking for the Zilots who destroyed the temple. The Rambam is going to blow your mind. There's a famous letter of the Rambam that he wrote to the wise men of Marseille. Of all things, the question that they asked of him is, what is his opinion about astrology? The fact is that their letter to him was a long letter in which they listed all sorts of ideas that they had learned in astrology. A person is born at such and such time, on such and such date, under such sign of the zodiac, and they go on at length about what it means, what his life is going to be like. The Rambam, of course, is the great rationalist, and in, the, in his letter to Chachmei Maaseh, he says that it's all nonsense, and, and, and uh, he's even going to say that this is Apodizora, this is idolatry. Astrology is also, also finished, all over. Now, I took only one paragraph out of that great letter of the Rambam. The Rambam writes, and this is why we lost our kingdom. 
and our temple was destroyed. And we've reached this point in time that we're a people dispersed, downtrodden. Our fathers sinned and they are no more. You know why this all happened to us? Because they found all sorts of books about these things, astrology. Those who see and study the stars. This is real idolatry. As we have explained in Hilchot Avodazara, they made the mistake of flowing and following Achareyan. They followed this nonsense. And they thought that astrology was an unbelievable, beautiful wisdom. That there's great benefit. Now listen to what the Ram says. Because they were involved in all of that nonsense. Because they were involved in all sorts of, of illusory or imaginative forms of wisdom. They didn't put their effort into learning how to wage war. Not how to conquer lands. They thought that all of this astrology is going to help them. You know what Jews should have done? They should have built up a standing army, a powerful army. Not the stars will help them. It's not the stars. And he says they, they were lost in this kind, these kinds of ideas, and therefore they just didn't place sufficient amount of stress on what's important. You're an independent state. You have to have an army. You have to be ready to conquer lands. And you have to be able to conquer lands. By the way, when he says conquer lands, don't ever make the mistake of thinking as though uh, the Rambam was, was advocating that Jews should go out and conquer the world. Jews should, could never ever go out on optional war without the permission of the Sanhedrin. Do you understand? There was no such thing. It had to be brought to the Sanhedrin of 71. Now, to get a uh, uh, permission to go out to battle from 71 Gedolei Yisrael, as somebody once said, 71 Chofetz Chaims. You understand? We're not talking about a bunch of warmongers sitting there. We're talking about Gedolei Yisrael, Tzadik Olam. When did they ever permit that kind of a war? It was only permitted when we were suffering incursions from neighboring lands. Only then did Chazal ever permit Jews to go out to war. So when he says Kibosh HaRatzos, he really means two things. He means, first of all, there were lands within Eretz Yisrael that had remained, that had not been conquered. And then, if necessary, to be able to go out and, 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 and wage war against an enemy who, who, who threatens us. That's all he was talking about. The Ramam says, because we didn't have a standing army, because we weren't ready, we didn't prepare ourselves, we thought that there were going to be all sorts of other formulas that would bring us peace and tranquility. And you know what they were? They were nothing more than some form of idolatry. They thought that they have partners for peace all around, and with a little mumbo-jumbo, they would be able to uh, protect the Jewish people. It wasn't going to work. You had to have an army, and you had to be ready to wage war. That's why the prophets called them scholim ve'evilim, fools and idiots. Vadai scholim hoyu. Of course they were fools. Va'achare ato and after nonsense, ashaloyo ilu. That's not beneficial. Halachu they went. The Rambam has opened up a completely new, uh, a new chapter over here in our understanding of uh, what brought about the korban. What brought about the Chorban? It may very well be, of course, that the Rambam is talking about the first Bet HaMikdash, not necessarily the second, because he is talking 
that the Pesukim where, where Yirmiyahu and Yeshayahu refer to the prophets, the false prophets, as fools. That's what he may be talking about. But whatever the Ramam says is true for all time. You have to have, a, you have, to have an army. You have to have a good army. You have to have the best army. Ramban, Parsha Yishlach. Ramban Parsha Yishlach is, is, is absolutely relevant. There's nothing as relevant as the, uh, the Ramban. We don't have to go through the whole Ramban. Uh, you see over there the, uh, the line above the crooked one, down at the bottom. The third line from the bottom. Va'al da'ati. Al da'ati. It's my opinion. We were guilty of beginning our fall into the hands of Edom. That's Rome, second Beth Abigdash. The parish is talking about the confrontation or the meeting of Yaakov and Esau when Yaakov is on his way home from uh, the house of Lavan. And it seems that Yaakov is in some way moving in the direction of the land of Edom before he turns back toward Eretz Israel. So he says, whatever, it's, whatever is said in the parasha of Yaakov and Esau, he learns something for the future. And he says, Aldati, this comes to tell us, we are the ones who began our fall into the hands of Edom. The kings of the second Beth Hamikdash. They made a treaty with Rome. And what happened as a result was Umehem Shabo Beroma, Jews went to Rome. And Romans came to Eretz Israel. Vihi Haitas Sibat Nefilatam Biadam. That was the reason why we fell into the hands of Rome. Vizem Muska Bedivrei Rabbutainu Umafursam Basvachim. Our rabbis mention it, and it's known in the Svachim. You know what he's saying? We invited the enemy into the heartland of Eretz Israel. We invited the enemy in. We brought them not as far as Rome. We found them closer in Tunis someplace. We brought the enemy home. And the Rambam therefore says, this began the fall of the, of the second commonwealth. We brought the enemy. Of course, there was Sinas Chinam involved here too. Because the Romans were brought into Eretz Yisrael when there was civil war between the last two members of the house of the Hashemnoi, Hurkinus and Aristobulus, two brothers. A country was caught in civil war. And one of them invited Rome to come in on his side. In a sense, they invited Rome in to be the ones that would be the mediators. You know, the, uh, the quartet, the uh, European community and all the others, uh, etc. They brought them in to be mediators and Rome came and Rome stayed, and Rome destroyed. There's one other... Uh, you, you have nothing else to look at yet. Right now, you're, I'm going to tell you another Gemara. And this is the famous Gemara. The one you all know about. The Gemara in the Sech, the Yuma says, Bayit Rishon, why was the first Beit HaMikdash destroyed? So the Gemara says, because of Havodah Zorah, Gil Arayas, and Shvichas Domim, because of uh, idolatry, uh, adultery, and, uh, uh, and murder, and murder. And the Gemara brings Psukim. By Yitzhani, the Gemara says, where they were Talmidei Chachomim, and they were Oskim Batoro, B'mitzvahs, U'gumilot Chasodim. Why was the second Beit HaMikdash, there were good Jews, why was the second Beit HaMikdash destroyed? And here the Gemara in Yuma says, because of Sinat Chinam. That's the Gemara in the Sefta Yomra. Now, just an interesting aside, but this you have to keep to yourselves. I just think that, you know, that not everything that's said over here has to go out of this room. But it fascinates me that on the same um, or the same page in the Gemara, where the Gemara says that the second Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinab Chinam, Listen to a little incident that the Gemara relates. The Gemara relates the following. Resh Lakish was swimming in the Jordan. Resh Lakish was swimming in the Jordan. And Rabbi Barachana extended a hand to him. 
And he didn't want to take Rabbi Barbachana's hand. Rabbi Barbachana had been a Babylonian. It may have been that at this point he had already come on Aliyah, I'm not sure. Rabbi Barbachana gives him his hand. And Resh Lakish, one of the giants of the Talmud, says, No, I don't want to take, I don't want to take your hand. And he says, Why? Eloho Sanino Luchu. And there are two interpretations of this. Either it means God hates you, or it means Eloho, I swear to God, I hate you. And then Reshlok is saying about Rabbi Barachana, who was a tzaddik, he sold all of I hate you. But he explains why do I hate you. All right. What's fascinating about this is that this is related by the Gemara on the same page where the Gemara says that the second Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. And by the way, the Gemara goes on to ask, which is worse, the three cardinal sins of Sinat Chinam? So the Gemara says, take a look at the Bet HaMikdash. It was returned to the first, but not to the second. Those who committed the three cardinal sins 70 years later already, the Bet HaMikdash was being rebuilt. But we are already all of these years and the Beth HaMikdash is not rebuilt. Sinat Chinam is worse. And here a Shlok says, I hate you. Why do I hate you? So he brings a Pasek in, uh, in Shir Hashim. In Chomahi, if it is a wall, Nivne Allah, Tirat Kesef, we will build a turret of silver. Vim Delet, and if it's a, uh, if it's a door, not surah la lo akhares will place a uh, will place a board of cedar wood on it he explains the the pasuk is saying the following ima sitam atsmakhan khoma if you would have made yourselves like a wall va alitam kulkhan bi may ezra and you babylonians would all have come on the aliyah in the days of ezra the beth hamikdash would never have been destroyed it would have been a Beit HaMikdash built of metal, of silver. But because you didn't come on Aliyah, you were the ones that made certain that this was not going to last forever. It was going to be wood. And if it was going to be wood, then Rikavon Sholeit Ba Decay would overcome it. It's awesome. It's 700 years after Ezra. And here, Resh Lakish meets in the Jordan, you understand? He meets poor, hapless, Sadiq Yisod Olam, Rabbi Barbachana. And he doesn't want to take his hand. He wouldn't stand in a Shasheret with Rabbi Barbachana. No way. He wouldn't hold his hand. Why wouldn't he hold his hand? Because he held Babylonian Jewry guilty of the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash. Would they have come on Aliyah? It would have made all the difference in the world. Even if they would have been sinners, but if all of Israel would have been here, God would never have destroyed the second Beit HaMikdash. I'm going to say the next sentence, but please don't ever, don't ever, don't, don't ever take this, uh, you know, it, it may sound a little bit uh, violent, and, and, and I don't mean it to be, I, I'm a man of peace, I'm, I'm not a man of, of violence. The Gemara is saying, you can hate somebody who doesn't want to come on Aliyah. That's what the Gemara is saying. Rish Lakish said, I swear to God, or he says, God hates you, because you didn't come on Aliyah. That, that's heavy stuff. That's heavy, heavy stuff. Don't put this into practice. Because we assume that every Jew in Chutzarts is either thinking about it or he's soon going to start thinking about it. And if he's in France, he's already think, doing something about it. But can you imagine 700 years after, after Ezra and Nehemiah, that Shlokish still holds a grudge against Babylonian Jewry? I think that we have gone through nearly all, not all, nearly all of the reasons that are presented for the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, except or Horben, except one. Yes. 
Yes. I will send you to the Gemara in Masechet Brachos Tav Dalet Omid Bet down at the bottom. The same Gemara appears in Masechet Sanhedrin where the Gemara says that the uh, uh, officers came in to say to David, we have to go out to war. So the Gemara says, when the decision is taken, Nimlochin b'Sanhedrin v'Sharalim b'Urim v'Tumim You have to speak first, you go to Sanhedrin, and it most probably was used in some of the battles that uh, uh, David fought against Syria, Aram Tsova. They were suffering from Aram constantly. Jews in their lives never went out to war just for lust of land. They suffered, just in Tanakh you see it, how much we suffered from Aram. And David went and he conquered Aram. That was called Milchemet Rishut. The halach of Milchemet Rishut, optional war. And optional war never means that it's just, we sit around one day and we decide, we need a little excitement in our lives. We need a little war. Never happened like that. War was only taken up against those who were enemies. And there the Gemara describes the procedure that they went through. After they went through the Sanhedrin, they had to go to the Kohen Godol and ask of the Urim Vitum, that's asking God himself. Not enough the Sanhedrin, God himself had to say, yes, go out to war. In Tanakh itself, you have a number of times that David asked, shall I go up or shall I not go up? Will they wage war with me or will they not? Should I pursue them or should I not pursue them? There was, war was always serious business by the Jewish people. We never went out to war lightly. Never. Okay. I have only one. The Haftorah. Uh, on the, uh, there's the front page of the Haftarah, there's the second. The Pasuk Yud Aleph, it's page 1094. Who is the wise man who will understand this? Or the one to whom God's mouth spoke? You tell us. Now, they're looking... Yirmiyahu was saying, people are looking for the answer to a question. And you know what the question is? Alma of the Hordets. Why was the land lost? Nitzitor Kamidbar became dry like a desert. Mibli over, nobody passing through the land. The land became desolate. Why did it happen? Vayom Hashem. The Gemara in Nidarim, and in another place more in Nidarim, and I think in Chulin, another place says, that this question, Alma of the Haaretz, why was the land lost, was asked to the Chachamim and they couldn't answer it. They asked the prophets and they couldn't answer it. And the only one who was able to give the answer is God. Al Ozvam et Torati, because they forsook my Torah. Ashenotati the name that I gave to them. Velo Shomu Bekolev, they didn't listen to my voice. Velo Hilchubo, they didn't go in her. Vayelchu Achrei Shvirut Libam, they followed the wishes of their hearts, and they followed the idolatries that their fathers had taught them. What's the Navi talking about? How many, how many answers, how many reasons did I give you for the Korban? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? I think I gave you around twelve. And nobody was able to answer the, answer the question, of the Horets, until God himself came? What does... What does the Pasuk mean? What's Yirmiyo talking about? What's the Gemara's explanation of this? Seven minutes and we're going to take care of it all. You know what I did? I simply took a look at the, uh, a second long look at the story of Khurban. And I found that there are six separate and distinct elements in Khorban. 
there are many countries that have conquered other countries. That's been going on in history uh, since time immemorial. How many times what the uh, Germany conquered France and France conquered Germany? Right? I don't know, I can't uh, keep track of all the times that uh, uh, Hungary and Romania and Austria and Poland, uh, they conquered one another. Uh, um, the Chinese and the Japanese, I, don't, I, mean, I, imagine, you know, I, uh, I can't even figure out how many times uh, conquests have taken place in, in Africa and in other parts of the world. South, South America, all over. There's been conquests all over. But the conquest of Eretz Yisrael was different in every aspect than the, any other conquest that ever took place in history. Germany conquers France. Did they then send the French out into exile? There may have been a moment at which Hitler, Yamach Shemay, in his madness, wanted to destroy Paris. Is Paris burning? But it wasn't done. Have, have conquering nations destroyed the art and the treasures of other nations? Have they destroyed their holy places? Does a destruction therefore mean that a land is absolutely going to turn desolate, dead? The land is going to die. No. I find six distinct portions, parts, aspects in the destruction of uh, Eretz Yisrael. Number one, the conquest of the land. Number two, Hurban Yerushalayim. Aside from Berlin, I don't think that there was ever another capital city that was destroyed utterly. Oru, Oru, Ad, Hayisodba. Destroy, destroy. If you're thinking of the British burning uh, Washington in the War of 1812, uh, Washington wasn't Washington, and the British weren't British, and uh, they didn't burn at all. Here, it, they raised the city to the ground. Third, Churban HaMikdash, the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Four, Shimimat Haaretz, the land, land turned in to be absolutely desolate when the Germans conquered France. The French still continued to grow grapes, you know, and the land continued to give out grapes. That's not what happened to Eretz Yisrael. For 2,000 years, this land was dead. Even historic uh, records that in the years following the Chorban, nothing grew. Nothing grew. And hardly, how many times have we talked about Mark Twain's description of, of his visit to, uh, to Palestine in, in 1870-something or other? I always say that's the description you can only read if you have a big cold bottle of May Aid and water with you because you're going to become so thirsty just reading this description. Nothing lives here. Everything is dry. Everything is arid. Nothing grows. That never happened to France. It never happened to any other country that was, uh, was conquered. Five. The exile of the uh, inhabitants of the land. Six maybe should have been number one. I think six should have been number one. Loss of independence. Loss of independence. You know what all of these Gemaras that we were talking about? Every one of them is relating to a different aspect of the Korban. When they talked about Sinas Chinam, Sinas Chinam explains only one thing. The destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Sinat Chinam is not the reason why Yerushalayim was raised to the ground. Sinat Chinam is not the reason why Jews were exiled from the land. Sinat Chinam was one aspect of the multi-destruction that took place. All of the eight opinions that we learned in the Gemara in Shabbos, all said clearly, Lo Chorvo Yerushalayim Ela. Yerushalayim was destroyed, a capital city to be destroyed, and it was a beautiful city. 
for a capital city to be destroyed and the enemy standing there giving orders, destroy, destroy, down to the foundations. Eight reasons why Yerushalayim was destroyed. Loss of independence? I think there, the Rambam and the Ramban, the Rambam and the Ramban have hit the nail on the head. You know why we lost our independence? Either, most probably both of them are true. Both of them are true. We invited the enemy in. We invited the enemy in. We are the ones who began our fall into the hands of the, uh, of the enemy. There's a mission in Pirkei Avos that says that Golos, exile from the land, comes because of Avodah Zorah, Gili Arayesh, Shvichas and Shmitas Haaretz, not keeping Shmita. Why were we exiled from the land? That's Shmita. And if anybody who reads through Parshas B'chul Kosai sees that it's clearly there. You didn't let the land rest when it should have? You'll be out of the land, and the land will rest for the 70 years that it didn't rest while you were there. So that each and every one uh, of, of the opinions, I, I, where, where should we put, I, I would imagine, the one that's more embracing and more encompassing than all, I have to say the truth, it's Rishlakish. Rishlakish. All of the sins would have made no difference if all of Klai Yisrael would have been here. Ilu Alitem, would you would have come up in the days of Ezra, Kachoma, Anmas, God would have tolerated in us in this country until he would have educated us to walk in his footsteps. How's the situation today? One minute I set aside for that. The Rambam would say, Hevra, you're doing the right thing. You have an army, strong army. The only thing the Rambam would have to say to our government today is, Ten litzahal lenatzeach. Let Tzahal go out and do the job. The Ramban would come walking in here today. The Ramban would say, Look up, Parsha Payishlach. I wrote it there. Don't invite anybody in here to be the one who's going to uh, assist you or aid you. This is your own territory. This is your own business. Don't invite anybody in over here. Sinas Krinam, that's a heavy one. And I have just a few minutes, a few words to say about Sinas Krinam. I, uh, last Thursday night I heard, uh, I was sitting in my car and I heard a, an absolutely masterful speech about the, the plague of Sinas Chinam, that we got to get rid of it. And of course, quoting Rav Cook, that the only way, the only way that we're ever going to rebuild this country is through Avas Chinam. Loving for no reason whatsoever. I was left absolutely cold. It was great. The sermon was a class A1 sermon by most probably the best speaker in the country today. But we're divided and we're divided over very serious questions. It's not simple to go ahead and just mouth Avas No good. More than that, do you know when you can start talking, at what stage you'll start talking about Abbas Chinam? First of all, I have to ask myself, do I love every, all the members of my family? Let, let's start there, you know? Okay. Do I, do I talk to my brother or don't I talk to my brother? Uh, do I beat my wife or don't I beat my wife, all right? That's where you start. That's where you start. What, 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 what about the fellas in the Bismarck where I daft? Are they the ones that I don't want to talk to and the ones that I do want to talk to? Or do I, do I love everybody in the Beis Medrash equally? I'm, I'm not talking about all the residents in your apartment building. Forget that. that. 
that's going to have to wait for Mashiach. I don't need, I, I, I think Mashiach is going, to wo- is going to move into a private home. Okay. You can't talk to Klai Yisrael about Avas Chinam when we have serious issues that we are debating. I'm not saying that the serious issues have to slide down the slippery slope to sinner. What a sense. What a sense. But it's difficult. It's difficult to have Abbas Chinam. It's impossible to have Abbas Chinam. But if I can start with my family and let it extend to the, to the boys in shul, and, and, and maybe even a little further up the block this way and that way. That's going to be the beginning of Ava. That's going to be the beginning of Ava. But anybody who's going to start lecturing me about Ava, you know, we're just not there yet. And by the way, I want you to remember the next sentence. I don't pray for a day that I will be Zoha to have Ava to love somebody for no good reason. I'm looking forward to the day when I'll be able to love everybody for every good reason in the world. That's greater than Avas Chinam. Not though he's this and though he's that, I love him. I will love him because he is this and he is that. That's a step far greater than Avas Chinam. I'm not starting up with Rav Cook. But that's exactly what I'm looking forward to. So, okay, so we can start. Uh, you already know who you have to start loving, and now, and now. But you know what the end is? I didn't destroy the second temple.